You think hatred is beautiful. Hello and welcome back to the Doctor Who Marathon. I'm your host, Mickey Dam, and today we're going to be talking about the first story, the uh, series opener of Series 7, Asylum of the Daleks, written by Stephen Moffat and is directed by Nick Haran. We will also be looking at the prequel episode, which is also written by Stephen Moffat, with no named director credited to the project. And we will also, as well, be talking about Pond Life, a miniseries uh, that led up to Series 7, which was written by Chris Chibnall and was directed by Sal's Menzantes, Zemandes. I'm going to butcher her that last name. Um, I do apologise. This was a... Um, uh, the main story now, Silent of the Daleks, uh, was a main big deal at the time because um, the Daleks, of course, it's a Daleks return, but it was also, as well, the first Dalek story written by Stephen Moffat himself. The Daleks have previously appeared in the Stephen Moffat era to begin with, appearing in uh, as cameo roles in stories such as The Wedding of River Song and uh, Pandorica Opens and The Big Bang. With their only real story prior to this being the, uh, the Series 5 story, Victory of the Daleks, which was written by Mark Gattis. So it seemed like, like uh, the idea of Stephen Moffat writing the story might have been something like he was building up to. As, you know, Stephen Moffat back during the Russell T. Davis era was a highly um, prolific writer and everybody just praised his work and then when he was showrunner you know it was like a no it seemed like a no-brainer so it was strange how it took so long but this story was to kick off series seven which uh, was split into two halves so we have the first half which uh, to, my, to me they feel like completely different series so series seven a and series seven b in my mind are two completely different series um if you watch the stories if you see how how they look and the cast they feel it always feels very different to me but that's beside the point uh the the actual thing to focus on a series seven is that each story was designed to be a movie poster although nothing really has been confirmed about it it has been speculated by many people in the industry that um, the, re the way the stories were developed during this series especially the first half series 7a uh, basically, you had the title and the movie poster first, and then the script, the idea of the story, was wrapped around it. So, essentially, the title, Asylum of the Daleks, was brought in first, and then the, the actual story uh, was, then was written. Which uh, sounds controversial, but uh, we'll see how it's um, played. There's also a lot of stuff that needs to be talked about, um, uh, but let's get on to... Pond Life First, which was a short little mini story uh, series featuring Amy and Rory's life mainly outside of the Doctor's uh, point of view. Uh, the Doctor only has a handful of appearances in Pond Life, with the first one being him uh, monologuing as he's on, um, he's calling the ponds, basically explaining all the history and stuff he's been through, all adventures he's had without them, which we get an appearance by the Sontarans, and I believe as well, the Silver Surfers board? That might sound crazy, however, according to the Marvel comic books, Doctor Who is part of the Marvel multiverse, and my doc the Doctor has met, or at least has appeared on top of the Fantastic Four building, so... It's not that crazy to believe that the Doctor owns uh, a version, an alternate universe version of the Silver Silver board, uh, which is quite funny. But it's, um, uh, Pond Life is mainly just, it's mainly fluff. You're not going to miss anything really, with the exception of the last store, the last episode. Um, also thing to note in terms of canon, it's a bit strange because from Pond and... And Rory's uh, point of view, uh, these, ha these these scenes take place between the two televised stories, The Doctor, The Widow, The Wardrobe, and Asylum of the Daleks. However, for The Doctor, um, it's a bit wibbly-wobbly and, it, and it's all over the place. To the point where, I believe it's the third episode, it's the one where The Doctor um, walks into them in their bedroom. That actually, for The Doctor's point of view, takes place 
during the power of three an episode in series seven so but i've decided to put it here because uh the majority of it uh, especially the ending upon life in which the doctor is trying to get an answer from amy and rory only for there it to be revealed that they've had an argument and they've seemingly split up and the doctor seems very concerned although he doesn't actually know the full going on of the relationship um that is basically teasing up for series um for asylum of the daleks um as that becomes a plot point in the story which um i do like pond life you know i do like the interactions between amy and rory but that last episode it comes out of nowhere they just seem to have argued off screen like you see the doctor monologue and then amy and rory you just like in slow-mo you see him arguing seemingly the day where amy and rory uh leave each other and then in a sign of the daleks at the start of it they've split up to the point where they're getting the divorce papers and it's just really strange to structure a plot line like that um like it's really it's really bizarre and the fact that pond life isn't focused on that the pond life is mainly just the ponds living an average day life and chris chibnall really gets um the quirks of these characters and arthur darwell and karen gillen really work well with this very mundane uh, script um at one point an ood uh, main part of the story is that there's an ood that finds himself in the, the pond's house and the doctor's just like oh yeah I, I must have accidentally dropped him off uh when i when i get back because uh, you know the tardis doesn't function properly uh when i get to your house i will pick him up and drop him off uh back to the ood sphere um but you get there's a lot of great comedy moments of um, how uh the ood thinks that it is their servant and um like he cleans their beds when they're not around he does uh, the dishes he does the the laundry um he packs their lunch and i like how, he, how the ood gives rory like a kid's lunch box a really tiny kid lunch box that really cracks me up i love that little moment but palm life in terms of a narrative flow it's like i said it's mainly fluff um there's nothing really in terms of striking direct in visuals um it's more like a doc doctor who meets a sitcom at at most though there's no laugh track it's really bizarre it's really bizarre but i do actually like on life personally i i don't I, I find myself watching it and enjoying it um a handful of occasions but now let's get into the main event prequel now this is actually um an estranged prequel because this isn't actually your average prequel prequel um back in series uh six where uh, were put on youtube or at least the internet on bbc iplayer about a week or maybe like during the week leading up to the episode here however though that is a similar a similar thing did happen it didn't actually air free on youtube you had to get it on the uh itunes i believe and that is just really strange i don't believe any other doctor who's um short has been like this had to be like purchased in this way it's really strange but it basically sets up where the doctor is at the start of that story and um essentially the doctor is in this cafe you know he's enjoying a mundane life uh, which seems to be a theme in um in the leading up to asylum of the daleks where he is meeting up with this hooded figure who seemingly has all this strange abilities he can seem to teleport and seem to change the environment that the doctor is in and one thing i really like about this this prequel is matt smith's performance because it's he sees a character that can teleport he seemingly knows him and and again this is something that ties into a sense to the ending of the wedding of the river song where the doctor is very hesitant to get into the action he's actually you know just quiet just eat in a cafe he doesn't want to get involved in any adventures and this figure has come to him almost as if a threat as though if it it wants to challenge uh, the doctor to challenge it to which the doctor tries to refuse uh, there's a great line in this like um uh, a woman wants to see you and the doctor says like uh, that's nice but i'm married <clears throat> that's a great line and the doctor realizes he's stuck in this dream state this creature has contacted him in his dreams and so he tries to wake himself up he finds himself on a beach however the doctor 
finds out that he's still in the dream and the hooded figure teleports the doctor to this room which is seems to be very familiar to the doctor and basically gives him sends him on a mission there is somebody that needs the doctor's help to save um i think it's to save her daughter this person's daughter and and this hooded figure has come to the doctor to give coordinates of where this person is and gives the doctor the coordinates and demands the doctor who recognizes the coordinates of of what the hooded figure is showing him and demands the doctor to say out the planet the destination and the doctor refuses until he wakes up uh, seemingly alone and we get this creepy shot of Matt Smith's face with this really strange almost emotionless light um, as the Doctor whispers to himself, Scarrow, which leads directly into the episode of Asylum of the Daleks. Uh, this prequel is pretty good. Um, I do like Matt Smith's performance and is much more confrontational. He's not as hyper or as quirky as he usually is. He's a bit more uh, down to earth. He's a bit more, um, you know, like, I don't want to be part of this kind of attitude. And I feel like Matt Smith, who usually is as quirky character it's just really bright nice to see this much more darker aspect of the character but again it's mainly fluff you don't really need to watch it it's mainly setting up the plot point at the start of the episode um but i, I actually do like watching the prequel uh, this is actually one of the prequels i do recommend watching because it's a nice segue into the actual episode itself and explains why why the doctor is on the battered Scarrow. But let's talk about Scarrow for a sec because now we're leading into the main episode. This story has so many continuity errors and the first one is actually right at the beginning of the episode. It is revealed that Scarrow, uh, I say revealed, it's basically the doctor finds himself on Scarrow being summoned by this, this woman, which is like again, teased from the prequel. Scarrow was destroyed in remembrance of the Daleks and was established again in uh, evolution of the Daleks. How the hell is Scarrow back? And even if they brought the planet back, they've done a pretty terrible job. It's battered, it's bruised. The buildings seem to be neglected as they've seen the turn to stone and there's this massive statue of a paradigm Dalek um, but yeah we will get onto that in a bit and essentially this character asks the doctor for his help as he needs the doctor to help her say rescue her daughter out of an asylum camp and this woman she found herself in the asylum camp but she escaped she needs a doctor to break back in and rescue her daughter however the doctor uh, bringing back that, bringing that um, that type of character he was in the prequel at the start of the story. He is he does get more quirkier throughout the adventure than the usual Eleventh Doctor. But I do love the start where he's like hiding in the shadows. He doesn't reveal himself uh, right away in terms of his actual appearance. He's a bit more, you know, he stares at this woman. You know, he's baffled, but he's not letting his guard down until he basically clicks. But this is a trap. Nobody has escaped a Dalek prison camp. No one leaves the, Dal the Daleks prison camps alive. You go there, you're essentially dead. And so it's revealed that this character is actually a sort of Dalek drone. Some sort of nanotechnology which um, basically rewrites D DNA to the point where they can get this Dalek eye stalker out of their, out of their forehead and they get a Dalek gun out of their hand. Whether it actually turns them into Daleks is, I actually, I'm really confused by that, but it basically turns them into Robo-Men, um, um, brainless zombie-like uh, humanoids from the Dalek invasion of Earth. And um, they are a very similar kind of warrior race of clones appeared in um, the Fifth Doctor story. I can't remember the Fifth Doctor. Revelations of the Daleks. I think it's Revelations of the Daleks. I could be wrong on that one. Um, again, that puts that puts well, that basically sets up where the Doctor is at the start of the story. But let's get into 
one of the massive negatives of this story. And I think a lot of people agree this story failed on a massive level if you are interested in this aspect of the series at this point. The Companions. Amy and Rory at this point have split up. They have divorced. And essentially the story... Um, from our main character's point of view, because uh, Rory goes to meet Amy at her workplace, where all of a sudden she's now, well, I say all of a sudden, she was established to be a, a model at, in the God Complex, which is a, a, not God Complex, sorry, Closing Time, which is a really strange character, uh, which is a really strange um, occupation after going adventures with the doctor especially how amy has seemed to have no interest in modeling during her run it's very strange but you know it's i can pass it um but what really doesn't work in this story is amy and rory's relationship in this story we are basically they we said there's some sort of argument and the characters don't like each other and essentially throughout the episode the doctor tries to get them to reconnect and the that's basically that's basically their story. However, two main faults really negatively impact this story. One is that we never really feel the the divorce, the the separation in a sense, because Amy and Rory basically share majority of the screen screen time together. Sure, they get split up, um, but majority of the story they are in the same place. And if, even when they're not, they're looking for each other with no, uh, seemingly no acknowledgement of the divorce until, unless the doctor brings it up. It's really bizarre in that point. But also as well, it's how the characters treat themselves, which is also kind of a flip side to that argument, to the point where it's the negative point from the other point, because... They are so negative towards each other. They, they just constantly, every bit of dialogue between them two connecting to the majority of the story is just them bickering. And it's so frustrating. And what's worse is the twist ending, um, the twist about them and why they broke up, um, which I'll, I'll get into when I talk about later on in the story. But it's, it's one of the main factors which makes this story incredibly hard to watch. But we'll get on to more details about that. Um, the Doctor, Amy and Rory, get kidnapped by the Daleks. Um, where the Daleks, the Doctor finds himself in the Parliament of the Daleks. And though, yes, I do know the idea of the Daleks having a Parliament goes against basically everything that the Daleks stand for. Because, you know, it's all about supremacy. Um, but, personally, I just really love this idea. I mainly like the shot. It's, it's the fact that they try to resemble some sort of a cohesive civilization. However, it's all based on fascism, space Nazi philosophy. So, you know, it's just... It's, it's strange, it's amusing, but I don't know, I just really enjoy it. I like to think that this is a, a new segment, a new force in the Dalek uh, Mamada that we've not seen before, a new regime of Daleks. Because in this story, essentially the design of the Daleks, after many criticisms were have with the Paradigm Daleks back in 2010 with the victory of the Daleks, and the, and the Paradigm Daleks basically seemingly being the main Daleks, of the 11th Doctor era seem to have reverted back into the bronze 2005 designs which fair enough you know a lot of people like the design however it does kind of feel like a step backwards um the paradigm Daleks are there but they're mainly background characters and again continuity error because the paradigm seems to be in victory of the Daleks are set up to be the superior Daleks and because of the Daleks philosophy will shoot and kill any Daleks they feel is inferior aka the bronze Daleks however here not only do they are they outnumbered but they seem to be working side by side what 
yeah, this is another thing about this story. Um, but, but first we need to talk about, the, basically, let's get into the actual story. Because the Daleks basically tell the Doctor about the Dalek Asylum. A planet where the Daleks have dumped all of their insane uh, Daleks that are too mad to keep. And they basically put them in this, this asylum basically just to stay there and there's this force field around it it's automatic everything's automatic nobody needs to be there no guards no nurses and stuff uh, uh, but the shield is weakening due to a ship that crash landed there a year ago um, and that there's this and basically the shield is lowering and the Daleks need to go down to the planet turn off this force field immediately so they can blow up the, the planet simultaneously, destroying all the crazy Daleks. Um, which, yeah, one thing about the story just really doesn't make sense is the concept of the asylum. Personally, though, it doesn't really bother me, but it doesn't make any sense even if you go by the concept of this story. The, the president of the Daleks, uh, no, prime minister, sorry. Yes, there's a prime minister Dalek. Um, Basically, it states that uh, the Daleks, you'd be surprised to know that the Daleks have a concept of beauty. Again, continuity error, because it's established that Daleks have, um, have no concept of elegance in Doomsday and Army of Ghosts. That's beside the point. Um, but essentially, they believe this regime of Daleks believe that certain Daleks' hatred, their madness is so... Um, beautiful their, their hatred is so beautiful that they do not um, they do not believe that they should die which again massive continuity error because one of the staples of the series is Daleks killing other Daleks the entire 1980s trilogy of Dalek stories is entirely about two regimes of Daleks murdering each other <laughs> and the 2005 story Dalek ends with the Dalek killing itself because it doesn't want to uh, be impure. It doesn't want to gain a sort of madness for the Daleks. In this case, in that case, it's like a, a much more human emotions. So, yeah, the idea of the asylum really doesn't make sense. However, like I said, this story is conceived as a movie first. Um, actual story second and on that premise the Dalek Asylum is really cool as a concept as especially when we get in there and at the start on the surface you've got this really um, almost like um, New Zealand under snow look which again I want to point out Nick Horan's directing is absolutely gorgeous there's so many different set pieces. There's the mundane environment, the Scaro at the start. There's the um, Parliament of the Dalek spaceship at the start. There's then the, the snowy surface, the Alaska uh, spaceship uh, where the Doctor and War, uh, Doctor and Amy meet um, a survivor of a ship that only seemingly was there uh, two days ago. Um, to the actual asylum bit where it's uh, clearly this uh, neglected place which is clearly designed out of some of the set pieces from the original Dalek story from 1980 uh, from 1963 so and Nick Horan makes it all work and makes it all feel cohesive as a director now this is one of the things I want to state because I feel like in terms of telling a narrative, telling a story, telling a movie, you've got to, you've got to imagine, you've got to realise that stories can't just directly tell you something. They have to go through a medium, whether it's a book, a comic, a televised, uh, television, movie, etc, etc. Now, I want to state this because I feel like if you work this story as... A, just a purely narrative. If you're taking just purely Stephen Moffat's script, this story falls flat on its face. There are so many point, po points that not only contradict the Daleks as a concept, but also the story itself. 
Um, like, uh, like the whole idea of the Daleks wanted to destroy the planet because they're scared, but yet they want to keep them all. Why didn't they kill the Daleks? These Daleks to begin with, they have no idea of elegance, but these Daleks seem to do, and they kept them on the planet. But they just so they want to keep them alive, but they're gonna easily destroy them without any concerns. It's all over the place. However. There's other things to consider, acting, directing, music, cinematography, and I feel like Asylum of the Daleks, when looked through that view, is absolutely awesome. The acting is brilliant, the directing is brilliant, uh, even like some of the side characters, that guy that they, uh, that they meet who turns out to be a dead uh, Dalek drone, uh, he was pretty cool and he was pretty memorable when he... When he kind of clicks, it's like, oh wait, I died outside and the snow preserved my body. That was a really shocking twist. And the, the makeup and the costume department on the zombie-fied, uh, rotten flesh of those people. Stunning. Um, and Nick Aran's directing in terms of getting the story a visual appearance. Uh, gorgeous. It's just that the script is absolutely dreadful. So let's talk about one of the big factors of the story, because this story features a surprise appearance of a character known as Oswin Oswald, played by Jenna Louise Coleman, who would go on to play Clara um, in uh, Series 7B. Her casting was announced prior to this episode. However, it was kept a secret that she would actually appear in the story seemingly as a completely different character unrelated to Clara at this point in the series as we, at this point, have not met Clara yet, of course. Um, which was a really nice surprise and as actually an interesting way of introducing the actress to the audience prior to uh, the audience actually meeting the companion so we can kind of get that grasp with her. And... Jenna Coleman really is this sweet, lovable actress who you can tell she is just enjoying the fact that she's in Doctor Who. She, you can kind of feel like she's been dying to get her hands on a franchise uh, kind of melodrama. And Doctor Who is this perfect vessel for her. However, again, the script. Because everything, every word that comes out of her mouth for the first half of the story is quirky dialogue which Stephen Moffat writes every single female character up to this point um, in, his, in his era. Every female character that gets a prominent role, Amy, River Song, um, Liz Ten, um, and now Clara, they all have this quirky, um, sexy and I know it kind of attitude. And for Clara, uh, for Oswin, yeah, that's mainly hit for the first half. There is this mystery about um, the souffle and how she's getting the milk. And the Doctor and her have this communication as uh, part of the story is the Doctor going to his asylum to try and rescue um, this girl who seemingly is stuck there for over a year. And uh, because she's been stuck there for over a year, she has hacked into the Dalek systems and she can actually like basically interrupt, uh, interconnect with their net, with their internet. Um, and basically that's part of the, of the narrative. She also guides Rory at one point, which again, we're going to have to talk about a slightly serious subject. Um, I don't actually want to like blame Stephen Moffat on this part because it's a very complicated subject and I highly doubt Moffat had any um, sinister, sinister intent in writing this line. Essentially, there's a line in which um, Oswin makes a joke about her first person she fancied was a girl, and she quotes and quotes calls it a phase. Now, uh, it has been brought to my attention by a few people in the LGBTQ and community, and as well, you know, you do your research and stuff, but calling some something like uh, someone's um, interest in homosexuality a phase is incredibly harmful because it promotes the idea that it's not real in a sense and pushes for and allows people not push but allows a softening 
for people to get out ideas like conversion therapy and horrible stuff like that. So that line really doesn't hold up well. It is absolutely dreadful and I can't stand it. However, I will say jokes like that was being made like during this time. I doubt Stephen Moffat had any bad intent. I just think he was very... He just didn't know ma much on the subject matter and you know you hear the idea oh it was just a phrase and Stephen Moffat just ran with that I don't think he had any bad intentions but let's talk about one of the story one of the aspects which you cannot really forgive Amy and Rory's relationship specifically because Doctor Who has recently in terms of where we are now with the 11th Doctor uh, which will continue on is slapping and um, male abuse. Now, in television and movies in general, there's this recurring gag, as you can say, a cliche where a female character hits a male character in a humorous light. Um, uh, there's two slaps in this story, both from Amy to Rory, and one of them is done in a humorous manner. However, Again, that's kind of a harmful idea um, because it kind of promotes that this high whole um, men should take it, take the abuse. And if they can't take it, well, they're not men, they're boys kind of attitude. And, and seeing that on television, seeing that in Doctor Who uh, kind of promotes that idea in a sense. So that, um, in a sense, when it does it in the humorous light, um, it really doesn't work and it's really really bad and it and it just makes Amy look really unlikable however there is another slap in the story as essentially Amy um she loses this wrist brand the Daleks have given her to stop her being converted um into uh these Dalek drones and so the doctor puts Amy and Rory uh together as he goes looking for Oswald at one point I just realized I haven't talked much about the Daleks I'll get onto that um and Essentially, Rory comes up with the idea that, okay, I'm going to, let's be logical. Um, the, the nanobots that converts the people into the Dalek drones um, subtract love and replace it with hate. So I'm going to take the, my wristband, give it to you, because it clearly in our relationship, it's me who cares about you the most. And then Amy hits Rory again, but it's much more of a dramatic slap that one scene that one little action completely ruins the relationship this is a duo which so many fans learn to love i've had my issues in the past especially in series five where amy was kind of uh, caught in between the doctor and, uh, and the rory in terms of their relationship um but you know there are great stories like the girl who uh, the girl who waited and um, I'm trying to think of, I can't actually think of any other at the top of my head. That's really bad. Um, yeah, I can't think of anything on the top of my head. Uh, that's really bad. Um, but you know this is a relationship that a lot of people care about and a lot of people are passionate about. And the fact that Doctor Who has a married couple on the TARDIS. Leaves a leaves a new, a new possible ideas and brings a lot of great humor and um, strange development into the, into the stories into the narratives and essentially with this scene it's established that Rory is unapologetically un not unapolog that's the wrong word is you know there's no way of looking at it there's no two ways of looking at it Rory is in an abusive relationship. And through the entire episode, they've just been bickering and bickering. And they seem no interest in getting along with one another. Why should we as an audience member care if these characters were to get together, if they have no interest for the majority of the episode to connect? And not only that, they, one of them would even slap the other just to try, try to get their point across. It's a horrible, almost um, kills a character. Uh, what's the word? I'm, what's, the, what's the phrase I'm looking for? 
character assassination. It completely ruins them. And after this scene, after this story, I couldn't care less about Amy as a character. And Rory, I kind of understand because, again, it's basically established she's in an abusive relationship. Despite the fact that Amy's like, how dare you to say I don't love you. Of course I love you. Um, and she basically explains why they broke up. Essentially, according to Amy at this part, something happened in Demon's Run, which stopped, uh, which the silence, the religion of the silence, stopped Amy from basically made her fertile and she could not have, she cannot have any more babies, to which Rory has always wanted a kid, um, ever since he was a kid, and Amy can't have any, and that's why they split up. Are you kidding me? Stephen Moffat wrote this? The, ca the guy who created these characters to begin with? One, the idea of the silence, who basically their plan was just to kidnap Amy and take, their ba take the baby when she was born, had nothing to do with them doing any sort of surgery to them so where the hell did that come from yes two they never spoke about this mind you by the start of the story rory and amy were at the dotted line on the divorce papers do you know how long it takes to get a divorce paper and it's only because of this slight this slight argument this slight thing of oh you know you wanted a baby and I let you go. Adoption! It was not your only option. You could have adopted if you wanted to. And in fact, three, I suppose, you did have a baby. River Song. But the whole story arc, your story arc in series six is that you had the baby. You, uh, the whole Let's Kill Hitler storyline is about them basically learning that they're okay with not um, seeing their baby again because they technically um, got to raise their baby after all with River Song as their best friend Mel's. Four, five, I can't even remember what number I'm on. Watch this story again at the start of this story, the way they have treated themselves, the way that they cheated themselves, each other. Oh, um job is that what you're doing i just thought you were pouncing i don't have a husband um these smarky comments they're not even like in the same room so the fact that like amy's trying to push rory out doesn't make a lick of sense and you they're saying all this because from amy's point of view she want she let rory go because she couldn't have a baby it's frustrating it's absolutely frustrating and the worst part is this is not only the this is not the only frustrating part of the narrative, but it's one of the highlights of the story and it's one of the worst. And this problem, this this breaking up, which really just completely ruins the characters, gets solved in this episode. It's not like a storyline of them getting together. It's not like a um, like a thing where they slowly learn to, to like each other again throughout the series. They literally have a two-minute conversation and then they start snogging again. What was the point of that? It's... It's just frustrating. It's absolutely frustrating. But, um... <laughs> let's get to the doctor's point of view because he's going to find, um... Um... Oswin. Now, again, there's something again we need to talk about and that is... Um, the promotional of this story because there was this massive um, campaign uh, that this story was going to feature every single Dalek design that was in the BBC storage. We were going to have 60s Daleks, 80s Daleks, 70s Daleks, all complemented into one epic story. The, the special weapons Dalek, the original Dalek designs from 1960. Three, 
all going to be in the story and that sounds really cool. There's even a poster with the Doctor holding Amy and you've got all of these Daleks designs he's standing by. So this is not actually an issue with the story but it's more of like the built up that um, the advertisement is. So this is technically not a criticism if you want to consider it like that. But yeah, there's one of the big advertising thing is that this story features every Dalek. Every Dalek, except for some background Daleks, are the 2005 Bronze Daleks. Uh, you might see, I think that you can see a special weapons Dalek. You see a, uh, one of the Daleks from Evil of the Daleks, um, like in the background, and you see a 70s Dalek uh, in the foreground for like a split second near the end. That's it. Again, it's not really criticism because it's, the story isn't about the Dalek designs and setting them all up. It's more just like a coolest little Easter egg in the background in the actual story. But it's it's more like the advertisement of it made it really frustrating. And uh, on a first viewing, it was really kind of disappointing on that aspect. And it does actually bring up massive continuity errors. Because uh, before the Doctor can get to Oswald, uh, there's this room of extensive care. Um, where basically all of these Daleks that have survived particular wars... Um, are basically is stored and we learn that all of these wars have one thing in common they're all classic Doctor Who stories all these Daleks survived the Doctor's encounter an encounter with the Doctor to the point where they have gone completely and utterly insane and obsessed with the Doctor they're all the 2005 designs which they shouldn't. That would be a perfect opportunity to have all these classic Dalek designs. But there is a fun fact in this in this scene. One of the planets that Oswald basically like lists off um, is one of the planets that appeared in the story The Chase. Only one Dalek on that planet had met the Doctor in that adventure. That Dalek in that story was dubbed Fred. And it brings up the hilarious, canonical, um, established law that the Doctor and Ian, the first Doctor and Ian were playing peekaboo with this one Dalek to the point where then he falls over a cliff. And that Dalek was so mentally scarred by that scene, he was put into the Dalek Asylum Attentive Care. That is just way too funny to, to process. And so... The Doctor gets to Oswald, however, uh, there's this massive twist, which, spoiler warning, because this is actually a really good twist, um, especially when you rewatch the episode and you see little clues, um, little, um, like, you, like, when you rewatch the story, you're like, oh my god, that's really cool, oh my god, I never noticed that, it's so obvious when you rewatch it. Oswald is actually a Dalek. And it's one of those ideas which I think really doesn't work in the it's, yeah, it's one of those ideas which really doesn't work on the script because the Daleks have converted people before. However, it's never felt like them. It felt more like Cybermen. Um, so it is kind of part of established law that Daleks can convert people. However, again, it just doesn't feel right. It just feels really strange. However, the direct in that pan shot and like, like I said, the little teasers like. Um, Oswald's screen is uh, the Dalek Eye Stalk and the fact that she has so much knowledge of the Dalek's um, security system. Um, we'll get on to the end of this story as well, which really completely is baffling. Um, and th that is just so stunning. I really just absolutely love those quick shots of Jenna Louise Coleman put up in the converter machine. And she's speaking, she's trying to convince herself that she is human, she's not a Dalek. But Nicholas Briggs' Dalek voice is coming out of her, she's like panicking. I absolutely love it. It's just so visually cool. And again, like the sound design, the acting, the, the directing, the, the cinematography is gorgeous. It's just the script that really lets this story down. But luckily because of this scene, it basically mellows out Oswald and she becomes a much more uh she's basically forced in the narrative to um 
to calm down a bit and have this really deep conversation about why the Daleks, the Daleks have grown in their fear of the Doctor. Earlier on in the story, she'd actually made the Daleks in intensive care um, completely forget about the Doctor. Now, that is a massive issue. And it, um, basically, at the end of the story, the Doctor teleports them back to the, um, the Parliament of the Daleks. However, uh, like the uh, Daleks in intensive care, Oswald, who dies because she, she didn't want to leave as a Dalek, uh, with her last lines being Run you clever boy and remember Which is a storyline for series 7 um, Basically she had hacked into the Daleks network uh, Moments before the shields were evaporated And before the missiles destroyed everyone And erased every single Dalek in the universe Of their memory of the Doctor Are you kidding me? Do I even have to explain why this is such a dumb, dumb idea? Okay, let's start with one. So the Daleks have an asylum, but they have the ability to access and rewrite the, each other's memories. They have the cure for any mental illness. What's the point of the asylum? If they could just cure every Dalek. We the rewrite the each Dalek's memories. What? What? How? What the, I, just, I just don't understand. How does that make any sense? Two, the idea of taking away the Dalek's memory of the da of the Doctor makes the Daleks so so uninterested in terms of a Doctor Who villain. One of the biggest factors about the Daleks, one of the main advertising points is that they become much more dangerous because of their fear of the Doctor. The story even establishes that at certain aspects of the story and it has been a um, big uh, interesting and probably one of the most interesting factors in certain stories like Dalek where the, doc and the Dalek realises the Doctor's out there does he become more confrontational you have that great scene with the ninth doctor and um the iron side not the iron side uh the megatron dalek um talking with each other and they just completely hate each other but they can't do anything about it the dynamic between the doctor and the dalek is so interesting um because the daleks are just fueled of hate that's their whole a ai ao I can't, I don't know the, the term, um, but basically they become more dangerous because, those of the, because the Doctor's involved, because of their hatred and fear of the Doctor. So the idea of re basically doing a reboot of the Daleks so they have no memory of the Doctor makes them far less interesting as an antagonist for the series. But you can clearly tell that this was mainly to set up the new storyline, new story arc of Series 7. As all the Daleks um, just scream and shout to the Doctor the question. The question that must never be asked. The question hidden in plain sight. Doctor who? And the Doctor sends their name Rory home and you see this. And the story ends with the Doctor in his TARDIS. Um, uh, basically enthusiastically going around the TARDIS calling out Doctor Who. Again, takes away from the dramatic... Uh, built up of Wedding of River Song where the secret was supposed to be uh, the question was supposed to be this mass secret that should be never be told however the Doctor seems to be very enjoying the fact that people are asking the question so has he completely forgot that there's this kind of prophecy that one day he has to tell the secret the, which to which the question is Doctor Who don't know you can clearly tell that what the story, what Stephen Moffat wanted. That's why he rebooted the Daleks. It's just made him so uninterested. And I would say it made them much more, it made them less interesting to look forward in later stories. However, we know, know retroactively that in their next appearance, they get their memories back. So what happened? 
seriously, in terms of Stephen Moffat as the showrunner, what happened? Were there abandoned storylines? Was there an idea, an abandoned Dalek story that was never shown? Who knows? But anyway, that's Asylum of the Daleks. Overall, I think if you watch this story purely as a story, as a, as a complete script, this story fa fails in almost every level. Characters are interesting, uh, if not annoying, with the exception of the 11th Doctor, played by Matt Smith, who absolutely owns the role. With the Daleks' um, quality in threat varies to not at all, to very just minor con inconveniences, with uh, many plot lines and uh, B plots in the story completely either unnecessary or just absolutely hurt. Um, the interest of the characters and leave it on the cliffhanger which actually makes Doctor Who's biggest villains uninteresting. You could argue that this Doctor Who story has hurted the canon more than the Timeless Child in my opinion. It uh, definitely has um, if the story continued on with, the, with that idea but luckily the reboot was rebooted if that makes sense. Um, however Everything else works. The music is gorgeous. This story, I, pro I probably... It is easily one of the best looking stories. But what this story does, it looks like it has the most money put to it. You can... This story feels like it should have been in a, in a cinema. This movie... This story... I keep saying movie. This story feels like Star Wars. It has many inspirations from Star Wars. And... It shines off screen, shines on the screen. It's absolutely gorgeous to look at. The music is brilliant. The acting from everybody is phenomenal. It's just, I'm so conflicted because if it wasn't for the fact that the script is so horrible, the story would have been absolutely amazing. So it really depends on what mood I'm in. If I'm looking purely on story, this story falls flat and is, in my opinion, not even like worth watching. However, in terms of everything else, in terms of a production, acting, bloody 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 um, viewpoint, this story is probably one of the best Doctor Who stories. It's a paradox of Doctor Who uh, quality. It's really bizarre, really strange. But Stephen Moffat has been a massive letdown for the series after writing the the very weak Christmas special, Doctor Widow in the Wardrobe, um, failing to give Series 6 a great conclusion with The Wedding of River Song being a very weak story. It feels like Stephen Moffat, who's the showrunner, is given some of the weakest stories in the series. It is an utter shame. It's an utter shame. But anyway, that's Asylum of the Daleks. So join me next time when the Doctor gets contacted by a unit in the future as a seemingly an ancient spacecraft is returning to Earth with some very strange cargo. So join me next time for Dinosaurs on a Spaceship. And I'll see you next time on the Doctor Who Marathon. Ta-ra!